Uh, good morning, greetings colleagues, greetings Said, Keisu, Sophia, and um, colleagues of the media. Sincere apologies, I, I had to jump out of another meeting, but, but thank you. I don't want to waste much time. Thank you so much for, for accepting our invitation to have a, a very quick or brief conversation discussion around this um, um, publication that our colleagues uh, worked on. Um, just so we can have a, you know, get a better sense of where we stand in terms of digital finance, the digital financing ecosystems and, you know, how we empower women on the continent. So, um, as we normally do, we would just start with a presentation by the lead author um, um, of this report. So we hear from the horse's own mouth, um, who is also here with one of our colleagues from that same division, Kei Su, would we'll hear from both of them. And then um, we would open up for any questions that you you would have. So, without wasting any time, um, Saeed, I'll hand the floor over to you, please. Uh, thanks, Ernest. I'll just briefly put my uh, camera on, so hopefully you can all see me. Hi. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, Saeed Ahmed. For those who don't know, uh, Associate Economic Affairs Officer in the. Um, a gender poverty and social policy division uh, within the uh, gender equality and women's empowerment uh, section. So I'll share my presentation um, and just turn off the video to help uh, and switch to presentation mode. Hopefully I'm aiming for about a 20, 25 minutes presentation and then uh, to give us some time for uh, any questions and, and answers. Okay, so I'm hoping you can see the screen now. Uh, can, can you just confirm? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Thanks. Great, great. So I'll just uh, jump straight in then, uh, Ernest. Yeah, I'm just conscious of time. Um, yes, just to go ahead. And just for the colleagues to know about there's interpretation going on in French um, for those who are French speaking um, to be able to follow directly in French. Thank you. Over. Thanks, Ernest. So this is a publication that uh, you know we've we've been putting together for a couple of years now. Uh, of course, we had uh, you know COVID when we were initially conceptualizing this and 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 various um, uh, roadblocks and delays. Uh, but nonetheless, we used that opportunity to refine uh, you know some of the data and information and 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 seek some more partnerships. Uh, you know while we were waiting for this to be finalized. Uh, so my presentation, you know, I'll, I'll briefly discuss the concept of, you know, digitalization across Africa, why we felt this was a, a relevant topic uh, um, uh, to, to highlight. Uh, we look at also the um, linkages between women's economic empowerment and digital finance. Uh, I'll briefly discuss some of the benefits and risks uh, or with digital finance, some of the things we need to keep in mind. Uh, you know, it, because it's not necessarily always just positive and, and we need to take a, a kind of due diligence approach to this area. Um, I'll give you an idea of the timeline of the publication, as I mentioned, uh, that we'll look at the structure of the report, um, uh, highlighting the, the, the recommendations which came out, the 10 policy action points. And then I'll briefly just go uh, into the findings from each chapter. I, you know, I'll keep it very brief because it, the report itself is very dense. There's a lot of data and information in there. Um, and, and I don't want to, to go over too much just to pick up the salient points. So first of all, digitalization, you know, particularly in the financial sector, it has the, the potential to be a, a critical backbone for economic and, and social transformation. Uh, you know, we, we predict that Africa's uh, digital uh, economy could reach somewhere in the region of about 300 billion uh, by 2025. And this project projected growth is a result of a, a five-fold increase in digitalization and internet usage. Um, and now these predictions bearing in mind were made, you know, just at the, the, the end of, of COVID. So as we all know, uh, with the rate of, of uptake of, of virtual and, and digital tools, you know, this we believe has, has, has since gone up um, uh, and, and will go up now that we're in a, a new era. And so really digital transformation should be a top priority. It's already recognized in the African Union Agenda 2063, uh, requiring, uh, you know, involving women in science, technology and, and, and innovation. Um, several regions, uh, um, <clears throat> regional organizations in Africa, you know, are already working to promote women's participation in, in STEM uh, um, uh, subjects and STEM areas. 
while digitalization brings prospects of, of job creation, you know, we know that the projected jobs and the jobs of the future uh, will be uh, largely digital. They'll have a very data science heavy um, uh, angle. We understand that it can also lead to job losses. Um, and so this needs to be managed, you know, as I said, with diligence and care. Uh, it's necessary to adopt a, a forward-looking approach, uh, looking at the types of jobs needed in the future economy, uh, the future digital economy, uh, and at the same time assess how competition in the different sectors can affect the landscape uh, and what the future digital economy will, will look like in turn. Um, so how can all of this lead to women's economic empowerment? So really, digitalization is critical to the realization that all components uh, uh, or, or, or for all components of women's um, empowerment. Gender divides exist uh, in access to basic services, decent work, uh, you know, whether it's infrastructure, the rural urban gap, social norms, uh, which we'll look at a bit more, um, uh, and, and other constraints and barriers. So of course, addressing these infrastructural gaps and social norms can provide a basis for closing that gap. Um, digitalization can, can empower women indirectly, you know, not just directly, um, if there's less involvement of, of intermediaries. So where there are third party intermediaries, uh, uh, you know, cutting this, this middleman approach uh, means that women can have direct access to tools and services. Um, however, it's vital that digital finance considers women's empowerment in the context of this ecosystems that surround the enablers and constraints. And that's why, you know, we'll show you why we've taken this ecosystems, a holistic approach, looking at all the different elements. Um, and of course, uh, you know, with women's economic empowerment, it, it's central to reducing uh, gender inequalities. Uh, in, uh, digital finance plays a critical role in, in that, where technology and platforms can provide low cost, immediate and smooth pathways for women to access and use financial resources. Uh, many resources, which, as we know, are, are difficult to access, uh, and, and women already have a disadvantage when it comes to, you know, financial uh, financial institutions, uh, formal uh, banking, etc. Uh, so, really, you can leverage these technological opportunities. Uh, the knock-on effects can create an increased uh, uh, create increased entrepreneurial activities, enhanced household financial management, uh, a decreased uh, burden of daily care. Uh, and work and reduce administrative tasks. So essentially freeing up time uh, and addressing this issue that we see of time poverty, where many women are having to split their time uh, in other tasks, whether it's uh, you know, household chores, uh, family rearing, et cetera, uh, while also trying to manage uh, uh, you know, finances and a, 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 a career. So what do we mean when we say digital finance? So this is just to give you an idea of the definition uh, that we've taken. Uh, you know, there are slightly different definitions, uh, but when we say digital finance, you know, in the purpose of this report, we refer to uh, digital forms of credit, savings, insurance, and financial transfers. Uh, so in the report, you know, digital refers to computing and telecommunication uh, processes that may or may not be internet-based. Um, for example, a digital account that enables processing of services uh, is a digital finance platform. However, a mobile money account that does not need internet access is, is also considered a digital finance uh, platform. Um, so we've taken the definition uh, widely used by McKinsey and Company, uh, which you can see on the screen there. It's also in the, in the report. So now the risks, benefits and risks, you know, we mentioned there were some risks. Uh, so we need to keep in mind the widespread use of mobile phones and, and other ICTs has the potential to bring financial services within everyone's reach. So that's a benefit, of course, in terms of access. Uh, you know, digital finance, it's revolutionizing um, monetary exchange. We, we can already see this in many of African countries, uh, especially among those who are not serviced by commercial financial institutions. It has the potential to lift people out of poverty and reduce social inequalities. Uh, digital finance can reduce the costs associated with receiving also social benefits and even uh, uh, smoothing, uh, smoothening out government processing. However, there is a growing evidence base that uh, ease of access to credit through digitalization can increasingly result in unsustainable debt patterns, in fraud, in increased consumption. So there are some, some um, areas that we need to be concerned about, especially when it comes to responsible lending, when it comes to cybersecurity, 
uh, and, and these other aspects. Now, in terms of the timeline of the report, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we started in back in 2019, the topic for digital finance was selected uh, as a focus area for our African women's report. Uh, consultations took place. By the end of November, we had an EGM on the initial concept and outline of the report. Uh, in 2020, we defined a conceptual framework, which I'll show you next. Uh, and, and, you know, this was the basis for our research and analysis conducted by ECA. Uh, January 2021, we held a, another technical workshop to review some initial findings. Um, most of that year, you know, it was a, a, a process of, of peer review and feedback. Uh, we held another expert group meeting July 2021, um, uh, trying to identify a network of actors in the region who are already working on this and further refining uh, uh, some of our findings. Uh, and then we spent, uh, you know, the rest of um, uh, 2021 finalizing the report and findings, getting it ready for publication. Um, we shared this with the Grasha Michelle Foundation, who are a joint author for this report. Uh, and of course, for most of 2022, it was the kind of editing, design and, and publication process. And we now have the, the publication ready in front of us. Um, so in terms of our approach, you know, why we took a systems approach, uh, uh, the, the main rationale here really was that we took this approach so that it directly mapped uh, um, uh, women's economic empowerment. When we this this uh, model we have in front of us by the ODI, you know, this is one uh, um, when we describe women's economic empowerment, um, you know, it's commonly looked at through different pillars, whether it's education, social protection, you know, access. Um, uh, um, etc. So we took this uh, holistic approach of, of women's economic empowerment, and then we tried to map this, uh, as you can see here, uh, and say, you know, okay, let's take a systems approach when we look at this. Um, on the left there is the women's economic empowerment model we base this on. On the right, uh, this is the con more or less the conceptual framework of the report itself. So we looked at the different um, elements, these being uh, um, you know, enablers in green there, you know, we looked at enablers where we said that digital and mobile connectivity, including, um, you know, ICT usage and readiness, this is essentially an enabler. We looked at prerequisites where we said financial and digital literacy and skills, you know, these are the prerequisites that are needed. Uh, we looked at risks. Um, this was in terms of financial inclusion and access to credit. Uh, we looked at some of the barriers. So we said, you know, these were, for example, financial products and services, you know, existing products and services and future products and services, how they can uh, create barriers for, for women. And then we looked at challenges and opportunities. Uh, and essentially this included, you know, representation of women in, in finance and, and technology, uh, uh, especially in terms of decision-making. Uh, as well as emerging, uh, uh, you know, regulatory concerns uh, with a gendered lens, regulatory concerns as well as rights. Um, and of course, the final chapter was looking at uh, uh, um, uh, digitalization policies. There were more policy recommendations. So these, these elements of our conceptual framework, they mapped directly um, to uh, different chapters of the report. So this is the report structure. In front of you, you can see we have the intro and then each chapter goes to uh, the, the different components. So we look at the enablers, the prerequisites, the risks, the barriers, uh, opportunities and challenges, and of course, policy recommend, uh, considerations and recommendations. Before I cover some of the findings, just to work backwards. Uh, so what were the recommendations? We had 10 policy action points that came out from this. Um, uh, and I'll highlight these first and then go back to the findings to show you, you know, why we came up with this. Um, in the area of, of digital connectivity and usage, uh, essentially what we call the enablers, the rec main recommendations were that we need to strengthen national development policies and plans by introducing, introducing strategic pillars that focus on ICT and social development and provide gender sensitive and gender inclusive policy frameworks. Um, we need to explicitly integrate a gender perspective into national ICT policies while ensuring that gender disaggregated data, especially on a mobile ownership and internet usage are collected uh, in national household surveys. Um, when we looked at the, the prerequisites uh, in terms of financial and digital literacy, we said that 
We need to establish a critical mass of trained individuals, especially women, to build relevant ICT skills to harness digital finance. Uh, and by embedding ICT skills as a core component of school curricula and prioritizing policy initiatives that are focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And we also believe that uh, you know, we need to determine levels of financial knowledge and literacy through national household surveys uh, and the inclusion of African countries in existing global surveys. So essentially we found that you know, there's not enough data being captured when it comes to uh, literacy, especially financial literacy. While there's some scattered fragmented data on ICT literacy, there's no real uh, uh, data on financial literacy. Um, when it comes to the, um, the risks, uh, we, we said that you know, we need to embed digital strategy frameworks and financial literacy into national curricula to encourage and facilitate children's understanding of digital finance, create work, employment, and entrepreneurial training schemes. So really here, we looked at other countries and we realized that financial literacy starts at a very, very young age. Uh, in some countries, you know, in the age of uh, 11, 12, uh, children are introduced uh, to financial tools and services. So this is something that we also need to make, uh, ensure and maintain uh, in the African region that children are uh, exposed uh, to this level of uh, you know, literacy, especially financial literacy from a young age. Uh, the other recommendation was to amend financial laws at all level of government to uh, encourage mobile money uptake, which is positively associated with savings. Uh, in particular for women across many countries in Africa, thereby increasing savings ratios and accentuating empowerment. Um, so really what we're saying here is we saw a positive link between the level of savings in each country and the, the usage of, of mobile money. Uh, so we're saying that we, know we need to encourage savings as a vehicle um, and further that some countries still don't have financial laws in place uh, where you know, digital finance platforms and services are available. So these also need to be addressed. Uh, in terms of the barriers, we said that you know, uh, there's a need to establish credit uh, a bureau and, and registries to support the financial inclusion of larger segments of the population. Uh, to, um, uh, for example, you know, we saw that there are financial, uh, 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 an increased number of financial um, credit bureaus in the, in the region. However, they still don't capture a large portion of the population and especially women. So here we're encouraging uh, the inclusion of women in these credit reference bureaus. Um, and also the need to address the challenges of gender bias as, uh, and associated assumptions in credit reporting. Um, you know, the report found, for example, that when it comes to credit reference systems, there's inherent bias in there already, especially algorithm bias. You know, when it comes to, to uh, profiling somebody and their credit worthiness, uh, you know, the, 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 the algorithms being used are, um, you know, are, are from, from years and decades back, or, or, and these inherently um, discriminate against women uh, and, and, and are gender biased. So therefore, not just, uh, you know, credit reporting systems need to be reviewed, but the algorithms they use to calculate and profile people's credit worthiness needs to be rethought. So it's really a structural challenge there. Uh, and and uh, the other point was to prioritize the collection of gender disaggregated financial data uh, by uh, uh, financial service providers to support digital finance initiatives and determine how social and cultural norms uh, and products and services affect women's uh, economic empowerment. So here we're saying also that you know, the need to increase the, the, uh, the sex disaggregated data um, um, when it comes to financial services. And lastly, uh, when we look at uh, the opportunities chapter, representation, regulation, and rights, uh, the recommendations are to prioritize women's representation in digital finance, in particular by including women in decision-making at the highest levels and set industry uh, targets for women's representation. Uh, and finally, to establish continental frameworks for regulation and access to justice in digital finance by using the African uh, continental free trade area as a platform and embedding digital identification using national registration systems and databases as a springboard uh, for gender sensitive digital finance frameworks. 
So he is really looking at the opportunities that we have coming up and how these can be leveraged. For example, we know that the, the, the most recent protocol on AFC FTA is to address e-commerce. Um, so how can we look at this opportunity as an opportunity and say, okay, let's use those uh, conversations, the dialogue and the platform um, to also uh, you know, discuss um, uh, these uh, gendered inequalities. So let's explore some of the findings from the report. I know those recommendations were quite heavy and dense. Uh, I'll just briefly uh, go through some of the findings from each of the chapters to give you an idea of, of, of the background. So when it comes to the enablers, uh, we looked at really, um, you know, the, the um, connectivity as a foundation for accessing digital finance. So ICT and connectivity as a, as a, as a foundation and a basis. And we especially looked at uh, ICT operations, uh, uh, uptake and usage. So how people use online services, uh, you know, that, uh, um, that can imply and, and, and suggest, uh, you know, digital uptake. So in general, uh, there's a lot of text there. I won't go through all of it, but we found that, you know, Africa has the lowest per capita usage of internet in the world. I mean, this is not new, anything new. Uh, we already know that uh, the region is quite far behind. Uh, however, the gender gap for internet usage on the continent has increased from 21% uh, in, in, in 2013 to about 33%, in, in, uh, and that was in 2019, I believe also 2020, you know, it's, it's around that 30% region. We found that there is a market gap of 1.1 billion women globally without mobile internet access, uh, including 200 uh, um, million women in sub-Saharan Africa. So the most significant barriers to mobile phone ownership are found in rural areas. There is a big rural urban divide, um, especially with limitations such as affordability, literacy, digital skills, and, and restrictive social norms. Um, we found that digital ownership and usage penetration are the lowest in countries where gender gaps are the widest. Um, however, you know, one thing that's very interesting, you know, although infrastructure, ICT and technology infrastructure in the country is, uh, in, in the region, sorry, is slowly increasing, um, the, the main challenge really we found is that usage remains low. So while infrastructure is increasing uh, over the years, so that's commendable, usage, especially usage of, of ICT among women uh, remains low. Um, and one, one final point, you know, which, which is worth mentioning is that mobile money services are more common in Africa than in other regions of the world. So yes, we're behind when we come to look at infrastructure and technology. However, we're leading the way when it comes to mobile money services. You know, Africa has the, the most uh, mobile money providers. Um, so only 29% of women in, in sub-Saharan Africa use mobile internet compared to 48% of women globally. So going back to the point there where I said usage remains low, usage is really the main uh, um, challenge for us. When we look at the prerequisites, um, so this we looked at digital skills, uh, we looked at financial literacy, and we looked at uh, tertiary education and training in the areas of, of STEM. So we found that uh, surprisingly, proportion of women in North Africa with um, uh, some of these skills that we consider as prerequisites, um, uh, you know, the, the, these skills in STEM, they doubled from 12.5% in 2014 uh, to around 26% uh, in 2018-19 in even, uh, where the global average is around 27%. So in fact, we're, we're quite close in North Africa to the global average. So, uh, there have been some huge leaps and bounds in North Africa. However, in, in uh, Africa as a whole, approximately 12% of women have sufficient digital finance related skills, which as you, as you can see is below the global average. So capacity development programs therefore clearly need to be enhanced uh, when it comes to increasing digital finance skills. Uh, globally, uh, a third of adults are financially li literate uh, the poorest people of those with lower levels of education and women tend to have the least financial knowledge. So, uh, as I mentioned, financial literacy is also a challenge. To improve it, it's essential to increase uh, financial knowledge, improve attitudes and behaviors, and develop relevant programs. What you see on the screen there is just an example when we looked at, uh, you know, ICT skills, um, and this was looking at basic, intermediate, and uh, advanced skills. So, on the right there, you can see North Africa. Um, across the board, you know, it's gone up um, 
uh, over the years, both when you look at uh, data for men and women. Uh, on the left there, you see Africa, uh, the rest of Africa, and you can see it significantly declined over the years, in fact. So um, ICT skills have, have been dropping rather than going up, whereas the trend is the opposite in North Africa. Um, so this is something to bear in mind why this phenomenon is, is taking place. When we looked at the risks, uh, we, we considered financial inclusion, of course, and, and digital finance as a whole. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, savings as a vehicle for financial inclusion. Uh, some of the key findings there are that about 43% 40, of, of African men have a formal financial account compared with only 33% of women. So uh, that's a huge gap. It means that you know, only 33% of women can, uh, can access formal financial structures, formal financial institutions. So what, what does this mean for, for the rest of, of, of those women who can't access those? Um, so, and, and I won't read through the rest of those, uh, just in, for the interest of time. Um, so across the globe, 1.2 billion people are excluded from conventional financial systems, um, uh, where two thirds of all unbanked adults, 1.1 billion, uh, had a mobile phone, for example. So the potentials there you can see are quite huge. While people don't have um, access to financial institutions, they still have access to a mobile phone. So essentially they have the means to access alternative forms of, uh, of finance. When we looked at the barriers, we, we as I mentioned before, we mainly looked at uh, uh, credit reporting systems, and then we looked at financial products and, and services. Um, just some of the findings there. Uh, although, you know, we said African countries have seen the highest growth when it comes to credit reporting systems over the last decade, in some countries, fewer than only 8% of adults are covered by such systems. So yes, the, the, the number of, of credit reporting systems are increasing, but the coverage, you know, how many individuals have been profiled uh, for their credit worthiness remains some, somewhere around 8%. Uh, so that's still very low. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we found credit scoring can have an inherent bias, uh, and that bias is undermining um, uh, gender and financial inclusion owing to design limitations and a, a lack of foresight in, in programming. Um, and in general, you know, gender uh, for borrowing in Africa are lower in countries where more women borrow money to start, operate, or expand a farm or business. So what we're saying is, um, you know, uh, where gender, there are lower gender gaps in a country where, uh, where the gender gap is lower, we're seeing that more women are able to borrow money uh, to start businesses. Um, so, so there are some linkages there. Uh, and where we said also in terms of savings as a vehicle, you know, we saw that where uh, countries that have increased savings as a whole, both for men and women, where more people save money in the bank, uh, we found that gender inequalities as a whole are much lower. Uh, so these are some important points to keep in mind in terms of uh, general trends. Um, at the last chapter on opportunities, we looked at women's representation in decision making. We looked at regulatory concerns, uh, emerging uh, uh, agenda dimensions of technology and, of course, rights and justice. Uh, we found that um, uh, gaps continue to exist when it comes to STEM. Uh, for example, in 2013, proportion of women researchers employed in uh, R&D was 30% in Africa. Whereas if you look to other regions of the world, especially for example, Central Asia, that was 47%. So we, we have only 30% 30, 30 of women working in R&D in the region. Um, across Africa, representation, uh, for example, at the ministerial level, we did see an increase in, in absolute terms where women ministers holding certain public portfolios. Um, and these were, you know, planning, education, employment, labor and training, etc. But we found that there's still some kind of, you know, occupational segregation. Uh, the, the women are still confined, especially at the ministerial level, holding portfolios. Uh, women are still confined to certain uh, sectors um, and, and are unable to break into or break through some of these male dominated sectors. Um, in 2020, for example, 21% of members of parliament, parliament in Africa were, were women, uh, compared with a global average of 24.9. So overall par parliamentary representation still also remains a challenge. Um, on the screen here, I've just tried to show you, um, this is what we, uh, when I was talking earlier about um, women ministers uh, uh, holding public portfolios. 
So this is looking at women ministers globally, and you can see, uh, you know, in, from 2010, the red to, to 2020, the green, uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the number of portfolios held by women has increased. However, you can see that they're still in certain areas. Uh, and they're still in education, uh, you know, employment and vocational training, uh, women's affairs, uh, you know, trade, they've gone up. But some others, especially, for example, finance, you know, finance ministers still remains low. Uh, so that's another uh, a concern, when, uh, at the, you know, at the highest level. And finally, in terms of uh, policy considerations, uh, there were five areas we looked at overall. Um, and these included, um, uh, as I said, the enablers, uh, the, the need to enhance digital and mobile connectivity, uh, the need to explore and confront uh, negative social and cultural norms uh, that, that discourage women and girls from pursuing uh, STEM uh, education and training, uh, to address financial inclusion, lower the risks of access and credit, uh, to remove uh, inherent, invisible and, and unwitting barriers that, in, that hinder women's access to financial products and services, and finally, for managing uh, digital finance risks through effective uh, regulation. Uh, and with that, colleagues, it's the end of the, the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, the links are there for the press release and, and for the full report. And we're open for questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much indeed, Said, for a brilliant and comprehensive presentation. You know, um, lots of data, but very comprehensive, straightforward. Good information. Thank you so very much indeed. Um, for those for those colleagues um, of the media who participated in a couple of, um, I think last month or the month of four, where we started this conversation with our office for uh, West Africa, um, you know, talking about, you know, women in Parliament. And we had lots of questions around, you know, when this will be scaled up to, to, to Africa wide level. Uh, and so here you've taken it, at, you know, several nudges up and we're talking about the, the continent as a whole so i'm sure that are very interesting questions to ask you um i already see that um there's a couple of questions in the chat box um the first one is from busani who says you mentioned that there's not enough data on financial literacy and that what what did you find as the reason for such scarcity and uh what does this mean for women's participation in digital finance. So maybe you want to take that one first, or maybe we'll read a series of questions because I see two more. Uh, let me see. Oh, those are not questions. But yeah, if you want to take that one, uh, I might ask add one question. Um, could you, if possible, and, and, and forgive me if you already uh, mentioned this in the course of your presentation, any examples of countries on the continent that you would say or, or according to your finding, are headed the right direction in terms of financial inclusion and access to credit. Please. Um, thanks a lot, Ernest. Um, and, and just before I answer those, I um, just want to acknowledge the uh, our, our chief of section, our officer in charge is also here, Keso. Uh, so of course, uh, you know, I'd like to give the floor first to see if Keso would like to address any of those. Uh, otherwise, of course, for the technical things, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take them. But, uh, okay, so just to see if you'd like to add anything, uh, over to you. Thanks. No, thank you very much, Syed. Uh, and good morning, colleagues. Apologies for, for joining in late. I mean, I don't even want to go into the issues that kept me away from this important press briefing. Uh, I will want, I, I want to contribute to answering the first question on, and on, on some of the issues that um, uh, you know the question wanted first of all uh, mobile connectivity is one of the issues uh, that uh, was found to be an issue as we have already shown through the figures and also through the arguments that we have made and also the policy recommendations that we have put forward mobile connectivity in africa is still an issue and more so uh, connectivity where women and girls have access that is one that it is one of the, 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 the barriers. The second one, uh, tied to the recommendations that we have made. If you look at a science, technology, engineering, and math education in Africa, a STEM access, women 
and girls do are disproportionately affected. This is why through this uh, publication, we are now propositioning for really an outreach to ensure that girls in particular do have access to STEM. We, you know, some of the recommendations that we made in this publication are informing our result area as uh, ECA. Uh, in other words, we are now moving towards digitalization uh, transformation to ensure that STEM access by girls is an issue. Another one is the financial architecture that we have talked about. If you look at financial inclusion or inclusion of women uh, in Africa in particular, there are a lot of barriers uh, that actually prevent uh, financial access by women, by women and girls. So if you look at uh, the recommendations that we have made really are tied to, 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 to why digital finance is still an issue in Africa. Let me uh, stop right there, but also to emphasize that the reason why we are doing this, the underlying reason is to ensure that there is economic empowerment of women, because we have argued that without economic empowerment of women, substantive empowerment is an issue. And we want to see a gender equality and women's empowerment through economic empowerment. Obviously, other forms of empowerment are important, but right now we are really arguing for economic empowerment of women as the right step to ensuring that uh, women are substantively empowered in the social, in the economic, and also uh, political. Thank you very much. I said you can take the other one on the countries that are heading in the right direction. And I might want to point out that um, uh, North African countries are heading in the right direction. Uh, the countries excluding uh, North Africa need to really do a lot more than uh, what North Africa is doing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Keso. Um, so I'll take the first uh, uh, question, or, which was on uh, uh, financial literacy. So one of the reasons why, you know, there, there's not, uh, as we mentioned, there's not enough data in the region. Um, now, first of all, you know, when you look at financial literacy um, and, and look at the existing, you know, global data sets out there, uh, um, the financial literacy itself hasn't been, it's, it, you know, the definition or when we, when we try to define financial literacy, I would say it's not particularly mature in its definition yet. So that's one challenge. When we say financial literacy, what do we actually mean? Um, so that's the danger. Um, uh, so, for example, th there are some existing surveys, global surveys, however, African countries are not represented in those surveys. So one of the examples is there's, you know, we looked at the OECD's uh, International Network on Financial Education, OECD slash uh, INFE. And, and, you know, this is a, a, a literacy of a national financial literacy and including inclusion survey. But it's, it's mainly for the OECD countries. So African countries are missing in that. And that's the one where I said, you know, it's quite comprehensive in that it's done at the national level in close collaboration with the, you know, ministries of education, educational institutions. And they really drill down and look at, you know, the different ages, age groups, uh, where people are being introduced to finance, uh, um, um, to, to financial skills, you know, what types of, of uh, transactions and things are they doing online, offline, etc. But however, you know, that's missing. It, it's, it's for OECD countries. Um, well, there are other initiatives. When, you, when we look at the G20 financial inclusion indicators um, uh, in, you know, in, endorsed by the G20, th they do provide some level of depth when it comes to, you know, the, the, the types of things that are being done. Uh, for example, uh, you know, it measures the understanding of ba basic financial con concepts like inflation, interest rate, compound interest, uh, you know, risk diversification, uh, purpose of insurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. However, you know, it, it, again, as, as I mentioned, the, in, in these emerging global initiatives, African countries um, are, are, are underrepresented. So one of the things, you know, as we've recommended, uh, is that we need to encourage and include uh, African countries in this, um, these data sets, that's one. Uh, and, and secondly, you know, the other point that we made is that we believe, you know, in household surveys, uh, you know, at the household level, even uh, we need to start capturing this data for of financial literacy. We need to start capturing data and information 
you know, at the household level even. Um, there are some, uh, you know, some old surveys were done. Uh, you know, there was one done in 2015, Standard & Poor's rating service, uh, services on global financial literacy. Uh, and again, this was in back in 2015, you know, the, the global financial lit literacy survey. The, that data, you know, while there is data for African countries, it shows that uh, most African countries are still uh, below uh, the, the kind of um, uh, uh, global um, average and the regional average remains low. On Ernest, on the point you made about, you know, countries that are doing well, um, you know, there's two aspects when it comes to doing well. Uh, I think two things that we, we have to be conscious of. Yes, if you want to say countries are doing well because they have mobile money services, you know, that's one indicator. And as we've seen, many African countries have mobile money services. In fact, you know, the region has the most mobile money services uh, globally. Uh, and of course, we all know, you know, the likes of M-Pesa uh, and, and what's being done in, in, in some of the Southern African countries. So that's one aspect. If you want to say, you know, if, if your definition of doing well means having those services, yes, that's, that's one thing. We can say we're doing well because the services are there. But our point at the same time is that while those services are there, usage among women remains low. So can we say those countries are doing well for digital finance for women? So that's another key question. Now, uh, the second aspect of doing well is looking at the, the, when we said the prerequisites. So are those things in place that can allow women to propel and really utilize financial services? So what we've seen, uh, you know, in terms of the, the core elements, uh, the, the foundation, the educational foundation that's needed. Um, let me give you an example. You know, as Keisu highlighted, North African countries have a very high number of STEM, female STEM graduates. Um, they have, uh, some of the countries are also showing some high rates of financial literacy. But at the same time, many North African countries don't have the same uh, number of mobile money services so you see them, there's a mismatch. There's a mismatch in terms of services that are available and then the skills uh, needed by women to access those services. So there's a, a mismatch of uh, services and skills. So that's really the main, the main crux of the issue when we talk about this. Um, so we can say, yes, there are countries in the region that are doing well in terms of, of services. And we can say, yes, there are countries and regions, uh, um, sub-regions that are doing well in terms of having the, the, the skills there that are ready uh, and women can immediately uh, utilize that. So, so that's the real big challenge there. You know, it's, it's both services and, and, and the skills needed to use those services. Um, so I, I hope that addresses the question. Uh, thanks, Oba. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you very much. For, for now for both you and Keisu, if you could cast an eye on the chat box, there's a number of questions coming in there. And there's one that's in French. Maybe I should start with that and then you could please look at the ones in English. Um, the one in French is from Bakari uh, Dabo, who basically is asking if you could comment on what available tools are there for women or to allow women access such financial uh, uh, platforms or access to finance for women. What tools are available? to enhance their re resilience, so to speak. I hope my translation was, was, was um, correct. And then in addition to that one, um, and please, uh, 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 Bakari, please raise your hand to talk um, if I didn't inter uh, you know, translate it correctly so that our interpreters can help. While you speak, they can help interpret um, for, for our, uh, our experts to explain. And then there's a second question. Um, asking from Paul uh, Tentena, did, did you do any particular research on East Africa, say Uganda, for example, or Kenya, or Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and South Sudan? If you did, what did you find out as the key issue hindering financial or digital inclusion for women in, these, or in, this, in this region? That's from uh, Paul. Uh, maybe I should add a third one there. Uh, this one is from, uh, again, from, from, from Busani. It says, given the plethora of challenges your study highlighted as barriers to women's economic empowerment through digital finance, what is the starting point in correcting the situation? And then there's, a, there's another question from Brian Googi, but I'll let you um, go ahead with those three, that, that set of three 
and then we can take this one. Hopefully we have 10 more minutes before we clock off. Over to you. Uh, many thanks, uh, Ernest. I, I can see there are many, many questions. I'll try to get through uh, those that we can. Um, uh, I'm just reading through them now. Okay, so we've done the one on financial literacy. Uh, the, the one in French there, um, I got the gist of it. Uh, okay, so did we do any particular research on East Africa? Uh, the question was Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda. Y yes, the, the report does give examples from countries. Uh, it does look at also, um, uh, in some cases, sub-regions. It, it does also highlight and pick specific countries, um, showcasing countries. However, in my presentation, I haven't highlighted country level data. You know, I tried to give the, the regional trends, the, the overall findings. Uh, but we but we do have examples, um, uh, in, you know, in there, um, and especially from some of the countries you mentioned, you know, Kenya, there were many examples uh, from Kenya also because of the, the, the rich studies that we have there. Uh, before I continue, I just see Keso's hand. So Keso, do you want to take the floor? Thanks. No, no, you can go ahead. I wanted to, to, to respond to the one that says, uh, given the plethora of challenges, what yes, is please. the starting point? Please go ahead. And the starting point uh, for us, this is tied to our mandate as the Economic Commission for Africa, where we are actually providing technical support to countries. As a division, we, at least for 2022 going forward, we have a result area on digital transformation quite broad. So the starting point for us is really to ensure that gender informs digitalization in every way. We have uh, set out a number of pillars on where we are starting. The first one is really on STEM because we, we actually want to see African member states institutionalizing STEM education for girls and also to see a movement beyond just a policy pronouncements to implement a, the, the, the policy undertakings that have been done on STEM. STEM is critical, that is one. The second one, which we cannot do on our own as ECA, we are actually working uh, hand uh, in glove with the African Union Commission on financial inclusion. There is a campaign on financial inclusion for women. And we believe that in our small ways, uh, the, the, you know, partners, member states, stakeholders really have to work <clears throat> on ensuring that uh, countries take some steps towards including women in financial architecture, because that is quite hard and we can't do it on our own. <clears throat> but for us as ECA, given our mandate as a think tank, we are already uh, taking steps to provide, uh, to, to actually undertake um, a research in um, digital transformation. We will be releasing our report on this by the end of the year, really uh, making a case for ensuring that STEM does take root and also to ensure that the barriers uh, that we uh, highlighted in our reports are really taken, uh, taken up. So really within our different mandates, we are joining the Financial Inclusion for Women, a campaign that uh, AUC has started. But in our own ways, we are reaching out uh, to member states to really ensure that STEM takes place and to ensure that we move from policy to action. Just to give you an example, we are working with Tunisia, we are working with South Africa, we are working with uh, Mauritius and Seychelles on digital transformation for women. So really we have already taken a number of steps, but within our mandate to ensure that there is a knowledge product that we can actually help our member states for the right uh, policy formulation and also for policy implementations on, on, on areas where they have already taken steps to ensure that digitalization does not leave uh, women on the side. I think I, I can put it as broadly as that because we are working within the mandate of ECA. Thanks, Keso. Um, and then I'll take the next uh, set of questions um, uh, by Brian. So the point, first point was 
how does access to digital finance enhance savings uh, for women? Can you elaborate? So yes, I, I briefly mentioned it here. I think the link we found is not that uh, digital finance is enhancing savings for women. You know, what we found is in countries where there are higher rates of, of savings, both for men and women, uh, you know, where more people save money, we found that there is an increasing uh, the, the, uh, um, usage of mobile money overall. And we found in those countries, there are lower, uh, the gender gap between men and women's usage of mobile money is lower. So, so what we're saying is essentially savings is providing a vehicle um, for, for access to, to digital finance services. Uh, and let me give you an example here. You know, traditionally, uh, when, when people want to access credit, they go to a bank uh, and they want credit. The, the bank usually looks at some kind of collateral being placed. Uh, and that collateral is, is traditionally immovable assets, whether it's property, ownership of property, land, or, or some other, you know, immovable asset. And now, as we know, already, women, uh, when it comes to owning uh, financial resources, there's already, uh, you know, various challenges in place for women's ownership of immovable assets, especially when we talk about land and property. So, you know, therefore, women find it difficult to, to place, uh, you know, in general, to put down this, this type of collateral uh, against their borrowing or their credit needs. Um, so they're already disadvantaged uh, because of various uh, restrictions in ownership. And then, of course, when they go to the banks, they can't access because the very things that they need to put down as collateral, uh, they're already having difficulty, you know, uh, owning those. Um, so really what we're saying is, is, is digital financial services, they, they are providing an alternate means of accessing credit in that you don't need to put down traditional forms of collateral to borrow against, uh, you know, um, and in some cases even, uh, you know, liquid assets can be, uh, um, uh, can be used as collateral. And this is where we're saying by having savings in place, they can show that they already have some uh, liquid or movable assets and those can be used as collateral. And, and the report goes into this in detail in, you know, finding alternate forms of, of collateral. Uh, so this is uh, one point. Uh, on the next point, um, on um, uh, point two, you know, where we, you talk about the credit uh, rating systems discriminating against women and denying them credit, uh, you know, through, through gendered algorithms. Can you explain? Uh, yes. So what the example, you know, and we give some examples in the report itself. Um, and here, you know, let me set the scene. Essentially, what we mean here is, is, is the example is when it comes to um, credit rating or credit worthiness, many women, they, are, uh, they have their credit rating associated with their husbands. So when they go to create a credit profile, that profile is based not on their own merits, but is based on the financial association that they have with their male counterparts, be it their, their you know, parents, uh, their, their fathers or, or their, their husbands, etc. So often what happens is, uh, you know, women are not given full and fair uh, consideration of their own credit worthiness. And, you know, we even use an example there, a very high profile example where, you know, one of the, the, the CEOs of Apple, you know, he, his wife uh, was denied credit, uh, where in fact uh, she has more money than he does. Uh, and he, they, were, they both applied for the same form of credit, but she was denied credit. Now, being a very high profile person, you know, she was able to put this on Twitter and cause an outrage. Uh, and the bank then, uh, 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 you know, was able to, to rectify that. But this is just to show you an example. And, you know, in this case, you know, this person who was high profile was able to call out the bank and, 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 and make a, a big fuss, you know, online about this. But imagine the number of women who go through the same type of discrimination where the, 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 the credit uh, reporting system profiles them based on their husband rather than them. And they're not able to, to you know, um, uh, make, a, make a huge noise and, 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 and rectify this issue. So this is just one example. We do give other examples in the report. Um, on the last point you made about uh, that the report is silent on how the same access is flourishing in some countries but it's entrapping individuals, especially women with ex expensive loans and debt traps. Uh, in fact, the report does highlight this. And uh, uh, we have a whole section, as I said, on, on this, uh, this type of responsible lending and due diligence. Um, and it's in the financial, it's in the risks uh, chapter, chapter four, 
Um, specifically, if you look at 4.1.1, uh, 4.1.2, you know, we discuss uh, a sensible access to reliable finance. We also talk about financial vulnerability. Um, uh, and we say that there is a due diligence and care that's needed uh, where, for example, you know, traditionally loan sharks have been operating, especially male loan sharks uh, when it comes to providing services for women, and they can potentially be using these platforms to, um, you know, leverage uh, the unfair um, services they're already providing. So, you know, we, we do discuss this in the chapter, in the risk section, um, and this also, you know, it does inform the policies and regulation that's needed in place to, to ensure that those who are already financially vulnerable, uh, you know, are not further exploited. Um, and of course, this, this is a wider conversation when it comes to financial inclusion of, of women. Um, so the report does highlight this, and you mentioned Kenya specifically. We actually do provide um, uh, examples from Kenya in the uh, uh, in the report itself, uh, because as I mentioned, you know, we, we uh, there were some um, uh, reports there from Kenya that we were able to use. Um, so I, I hope that helps uh, address that. And I don't know if there are any other uh, questions there. Um, yes. There, there is there is a question, the last one. If I may kindly ask our colleagues uh, of IT to please enable Komi. Komi, if you could please take the floor and ask your question. I'm just making sure I don't use my, uh, my very unprofessional translation skills to massacre you know, the, the content of your question. So that if you can ask, take the floor and ask your question so that the interpreters can help us through, please. Komi, if you're there. Yeah. Is Komi there? Uh, IT colleagues, if you could kindly enable his mic. There you go. We are. Yes, Komi. Vous avez la parole. Oui. Si oui. Votre question, bon, comme ça. Oui. Bonjour. Bonjour, chers panélistes. Et bonjour également aux, aux orateurs. Je suis Komi, je suis journaliste au Togo. Alors, je voudrais poser deux questions. Il dit, l'Afrique, depuis un certain moment, connaît depuis quelques années l'émergence des fintech qui proposent du service digital financier. Est-ce est une opportunité pour les femmes à avoir plus accès aux services financiers? Et ma deuxième question est de savoir quelles actions doivent mener toutes les femmes africaines qui accèdent aux politiques pour booster l'inclusion financière sur le continent? Voilà mes deux questions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Komi. Um, Sai, did you get that? Can you see? Uh, th thanks, Ernest. I, I got the, fir the first part of the question. Um, I think the second one, just if you could please repeat. Uh, D'accord. D'accord. Je voudrais savoir quelle action doivent mener toutes ces femmes africaines qui accèdent aux postes politiques pour pouvoir booster l'inclusion financière sur le continent. Quelle action les femmes doivent mener sur le continent? Je ne sais pas, auprès des gouverneurs ou même auprès des partenaires. Qu'est-ce qu'elles doivent faire concrètement pour pouvoir booster l'inclusion financière sur le continent? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks. I, I got that now. So the, the first... Um, uh, question I'll address that uh, and in, if I understood it correctly it was you know the continent is seeing a, a large number um, of um, fintech um, uh, services um, uh, you know availability of fintech services so uh, it, it does this mean that you know women can can um, uh, benefit from these you know in essence we're saying yes of course this is the premise you know that there are yes while we have you know the opportunities there because the, the the we have the services there however there are various things in place that that we need to keep in mind when it comes to uh, you know the, the women being able to utilize these services uh, and that's why we've taken this uh, you know uh, systems approach uh, looking at each of the components so we've said in terms of the infrastructure and the, the in, uh, what we call the enablers, the infrastructure, 
the, uh, so we're making sure that the connectivity needs to be in place for women. We already know that connectivity, mobile connectivity is much lower for women than it is for men. So that's number one in terms of enablers. In terms of the skills needed, uh, we need to make sure that more women have uh, digital literacy skills, not just financial literacy, as we mentioned as a whole, but digital literacy, literacy skills, because we also see that uh, digital literacy is lower among women than men, uh, especially, uh, you know, and, and as a result, uh, digital the usage of, of these uh, uh, ICT and digital tools. So these need to be in place. From the perspective of, of risks, we need to make sure, as was pointed out already, uh, that uh, regulation and, and, and procedures, policies need to be in place that make sure that you know, women uh, who are already, in some cases, financially vulnerable, as we've said before, because of their lack of access to formal uh, institutions. So you know, if they choose these alternate forms uh, and if they choose digital finance as, as, a, as, a, as a platform, then, then we need to ensure that that um, uh, processes, procedures are in place to uh, provide some type of, of protection uh, uh, to the vulnerabilities that they're exposed to. You know, if they only have a, this alternate path of embracing digital finance, we need to make sure that responsible lending is in place, due diligence is in place, uh, and, and oversight and regulation is in place. Um, so so it, it's a number of things really. Yes, we're saying uh, we have this great opportunity where Africa has these services, but we need to make sure that uh, you know, other things are in place to make sure that women can fully uh, participate and benefit from this without exploitation uh, and without all the negative uh, uh, risks that, uh, that are potentially also in front of us. For the second um, part of the question, um, uh, which was, uh, uh, sorry, so if you could just remind me of the second question uh, again. Ok. Euh, euh, le, le, rapport, le, le rapport insiste aussi sur euh, beaucoup de femmes aujourd'hui qui arrivent à avoir accès aux postes politiques ou bien aux postes décisionnels. Yes. Alors, yes. Je, voudrais, je voudrais savoir comment est-ce que ces femmes peuvent, en collaboration avec les partenaires euh, dans les pays africains ou à travers même les institutions financières internationales, peuvent aider les pays ou bien peuvent aider le continent à booster aujourd'hui l'inclusion financière sur le continent. Yes, thank you, thank you, and, and apologies. Um, so yes, the question, uh, you know, that there are, if, if we include women at the highest levels, if we include women uh, at the decision-making levels, how can, you know, we have this knock-on effect of then empowering and, and supporting other women Really, the, the premise here is, as we've seen, uh, you know, as we've highlighted, there are structural imbalances in place where, um, and, and just one example is, as we said, gender bias algorithms that banks and financial institutions are using. This is just one example. Uh, one of the ways, uh, and, and uh, you know, that, that women can benefit is if you have women designing those very algorithms, designing those very policies, designing the, the legislation, the regulations, they can already from, from the outset, from the beginning, uh, they can keep in mind other challenges and issues that women further down the line uh, will be facing. Uh, the reason we have some of these structural imbalances is because when some of these services, products, uh, services, um, and, and other associated um, uh, mechanisms, when they have been designed originally, we perhaps did not keep uh, the considerations of women in mind, the specific considerations of women in mind. Um, so this is why we're saying by including women further up uh, the decision-making and uh, chain and in the design process, it means that the outcomes will ensure uh, that you have gendered outcomes, outcomes that specifically are tailored for addressing uh, uh, you know, the, the specific needs of, of women. And again, one example, another example here I can give you is when we talk about um, access to credit. And, and the, the question was also in the broader financial inclusion. How can we ensure, you know, women, women uh, uh, financial inclusion more broadly for women? You know, we know, as I said, the, the model, model of, of, of 
formal financial institutions has been, you know, in order to, um, uh, to access credit or request credit or finances, financing, whether it's, you know, uh, to, to pay off uh, uh, um, uh, some, some um, you know, home uh, expenses or to open up a business, et cetera. We know, for example, that women need to show uh, traditional forms of collateral, as I, I, as I highlighted, whether that's, uh, you know, land or property, et cetera. That is by design. Now, if there is someone at the design stage saying, hold on a second, but many women already have trouble with property ownership in many of the countries for various legal reasons, for inheritance reasons, for cultural inheritance reasons, for legal inheritance reasons. You know, there are things in place which make it difficult for them to, to show full property ownership. Then it means that, you know, when it, uh, those very structures can be questioned. Are they appropriate for women? Is that model appropriate for women when we already know that they're disadvantaged? This is just a, a, you know, a, a, another example for you of how by design, we need to readdress the structural imbalances in place uh, you know, that are putting up obstacles for women to access finance. Um, and, and your point also was about financial inclusion in general. You know, when we talk about financial inclusion, there's two aspects to financial inclusion. There is the formal traditional financial institutions. Uh, you know, these are your banks, your traditional banks, et cetera. But there's also informal uh, and, and emerging uh, uh, financial services. And this is where we're highlighting that digital finance as an emerging uh, market, as an emerging platform can perhaps rethink some of these traditional structures and say, hold on, this is an opportunity for us to provide services for women and we can readdress some of the structural uh, obstacles in place. Um, so, so I hope that answers the question. You know, we have opportunities in place, but when it comes to financial inclusion, there's formal financial inclusion, there's informal financial inclusion, uh, and there's also you know, this digital finance which, which is in between. Uh, and, and it's really an opportunity to rethink uh, the, the, the traditional structures in place. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Thank you very much, Said. Thanks indeed. Uh, I think we've run out over and above our time or the time allocated for this. So maybe um, uh, 10, 15 seconds, case who last word to the press, and then we would uh, conclude. 10, 15 seconds, maybe. A few yeah. seconds uh, to the press is that for ECA, we are saying digital finance is a way or a new, we are seeing an opportunity in digital finance to economically empower women. And we need strong policies and strong policy implementation to ensure that women are included in the financial architecture so that we can actually see substantive, uh, uh, substantive uh, gender equality realized in the continent. Really broadly, this is the bigger picture that we are looking at as ECA. And digital finance is actually an enabler for women's economic empowerment for substantive equality. That's my last word, Ernest. Thank you very much to you both. Thanks indeed. Very interesting um, um, topic. I personally have a number of questions, but I'm pretty sure we can expand on them you know, in the, the context of the ECA podcast but also to thank all the members of the press, really. We are, great, we are grateful that you took the time to participate as you always do. We're really grateful. And just to say thank you to you. And then we'll look forward to seeing you next month when we schedule the next one. If you do have any requests for one-on-one for -on -one interviews with, with the experts, please do not hesitate to, as always, reach out through um, our able colleague, Sophia, and we'll, we'll facilitate for you. And to our colleagues, who did the interpretation. Thank you so, so much. We couldn't pull this without you and our IT colleagues as well. A very big thank you to you all and wishing you all a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks and bye-bye to you all. Thanks, Ernest. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ernest. Bye-bye to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.